Great. Thank you all for being here, and thank you to the Detroit Institute for, of Arts for hosting us. Um, my name is Sandra Furman, and while I was just appointed director and chief curator of the Colorado University Art Museum in Boulder, the impetus for this panel came from my experience in Buffalo, New York over the last decade, where I was curator of the University at Buffalo Art Galleries. One of the last exhibitions I curated with my colleague Trey Buscarin brought art outside the museum to activate the city, including the Buffalo River, public transit, and an urban farm, among other diverse sites. Our exhibition attempted to erode some of the physical and psychological barriers that remain palpable in the city, while celebrating temporary relationships between people, materials, and neighborhoods. All of this involved collaborating with those who might not normally have much exposure to art and artists, local business owners, farmers, barge operators, real estate developers, and a mass transit public official demonstrate a spirited willingness to take risks in forming unconventional partnerships and think imaginatively about how spaces can be perceived and used differently. My practice as a curator is deeply informed by a local sense of belonging to the place in which I live and work. Many of today's arts institutions are well aware that for our continued relevance, it is imperative that museums of various sizes interact with eclectic demographic range by decentralizing some programmatic efforts towards the cultivation of meaningful relationships with local communities on their own turf, or by forming mutually beneficial partnerships with organizations and people in which financial resources and knowledge can be shared. This was evident at both the Heidelberg Project and Powerhouse Productions that some of us had the pleasure to visit on Saturday. Cities provide public spaces for civic and cultural experiments like these, not to mention public forms of dissent. Bike share programs, participatory budgeting, social justice organizations, and socially engaged public artworks and events are part of an ecosystem of human relationships and human interaction with the environment. It is productive and potentially revolutionary to look at these initiatives in concert and identify opportunities for exchange. The four panels today speak to these points of connection and how to devise and sustain cultural programs in cities that are undergoing extensive urban renewal, shrinking or burgeoning populations, and shifts in demographics. I will briefly introduce the panelists in the order that they will be presenting. Longer bios with their impressive array of accomplishments can be found in the conference catalog. I ask that you please hold your applause until the end. Um, we will hear first from Andrew Hersher, who is an associate professor at the Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning at the University of Michigan in nearby Ann Arbor, followed by Patricia Lawn, founder and director of Calta 21. Michael Chavez, public art manager for the city of Denver, will be speaking next, and Christina Chang, curator of engagement at the Minnesota Museum of American Art, will conclude our program. So, Andrew? Thank you. Where should I point this? I think I... Uh, thank you, Sandra. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm very happy to be on this panel. I'm very happy to be able to participate in this discussion. Um, I'm also very unqualified to be on this panel. I'm also very unqualified to participate in this discussion. I don't, uh, like I imagine all of you, work in a museum. I don't study museums. Uh, most, if not all, of my engagement with museums takes place as a mere visitor. Um, I think uh, uh, Sandra posed extremely uh, interesting and incisive questions to us as a panel, but um, as someone with absolutely no connection to the museum world, uh, I'm also, I think, entirely incapable uh, 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 of answering uh, uh, her questions. So, so uh, apologies. Uh, this is a disclaimer. Uh, um, what I prepared instead is a kind of uh, a re response to Sandra's questions from the perspective of someone who thinks a lot about what's often called um, uh, uh, informal urbanism or, 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 or public culture. Um, so, 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 so reading uh, uh, the questions that Sandra posed to us with, with my uh, really wholly unstudied understanding of 
the museum and my somewhat uh, studied understanding of, of, of informality uh, and, and public space, what, what struck me was, was the way in which the questions seemed to reflect a kind of uh, concern or maybe even anxiety about the relationship between the museum and uh, uh, the museum's various publics. What, what, these were publics who, who uh, in, in the questions that were posed to us, named uh, community groups, immigrant groups, grassroots voices, local constituencies, uh, 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 diverse audiences, um, uh, among uh, uh, other things. Um, uh, the description of our panel seemed, uh, to me anyway, to emerge from some sense of a, a kind of separation or breach between the museum and its publics. Uh, terms like engagement or participation or, or collaboration seem to name, to me anyway, the, 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 the processes by, by means of which the museum uh, might establish new relationships uh, uh, to, to these kinds of um, excluded or, or ignored publics. And what seemed to be at stake here, uh, to me anyway, was uh, relevancy. Uh, maybe there's a political dimension to this relevancy. Maybe there's also uh, a, a fiscal dimension to this relevancy. As we just uh, uh, heard from Graham, uh, at a place like the DIA, it's impossible to understand those two dimensions, the political and the fiscal, as anything but intertwined. But what if museums are only the most visible, formal, and institutionalized sites of collection and exhibition practices that, that, that might be dispersed across the publics that museums are seeking to connect with? What if publics are also doing the work of cultural engagement, cultural production, and cultural memory that museums are, are understanding themselves as, as, as doing? What if publics exist not only as the museum's collaborators or, 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 or co-creators, but also as everyday curators and exhibitors of culture in their own right? And, and what if then museums might not only have publics, but but in a certain sense, publics might also have what might be considered museums. In other words, self-organized spaces that, that sometimes might pass by other names and uh, sometimes might pass without notice at all. Um, I have no idea what these sort of propositions sound like in the world of the museum, the world that I imagine uh, most of you inhabit. But in any case, what I'm gonna do in, in, in the, the, the time I have um, uh, uh, which follows, is I'm, I'm gonna try to advance these propositions by sharing with you three examples of what might be called public museology. And, and these will all be examples from uh, uh, Detroit, the, a city that, that, that I gather you're just be, be becoming familiar with. Um, I, I wanna frame these examples by three terms. One term is intimacy. And by intimacy, I mean close, small-scale, and long-term relationships between the authors of these, the, the, these, these projects in public museology and their participants. In other words, these, these are not projects that prize or desire growth, expansion, uh, uh, publicity, or, or sometimes uh, 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 even an audience. Uh, is there such a thing as public intimacy? That, that's one of the questions that I think these projects raise. Uh, a second term is contingency. Uh, and by this I mean uh, an exposure to, to chance, to change, to improvisation, uh, instead of a, a dedication to predetermined goals or ambitions. Can, can contingency be productive as well as threatening? That's, that's another question that these, these projects raise. And, and, and the third term is precarity, by, by which I mean a condition of insecurity and vulnerability. Is precarity a consequence of commitments to intimacy and contingency? And, and that's still another question that I think is raised here. And, and I, I should mention uh, now that the, the three projects I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna share with you now uh, each have disappeared in the last few years, which I think, if, if nothing else, testifies to the, the kind of precarity of, of, of their own existence. Um, the Car Wash Cafe was a kind of uh, perhaps outsider museum uh, that, that functioned explicitly as an open air auto storage yard, party venue, barbecue garden, and auto ephemera collection. Uh, the, the author of the, of the project, uh, Larry Meeks, owned an auto styling salon on the east side of Detroit. And he, he purchased 
the, the site of the car wash cafe a few blocks from his salon to use as a storage facility for, for cars that uh, uh, he was in the process of repairing. Um, he then started a car wash to employ uh, 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 teens from the surrounding neighborhood. And when, when customers of the car wash and neighborhood residents began to, to, to congregate there, he, he, he opened an ice cream stand to provide a place to linger. And this, this eventually became a sit-down cafe, which spilled over into the adjacent auto storage yard, which sponsored its transformation into a, a, a barbecue garden and, and a party venue. Um, in all of this, 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 this kind of uh, these, 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 these explicit programs, these, these, these explicit functions, were complemented by the way that uh, Larry Meeks was using the, the, the spaces inside and outside to display objects that he collected, um, um, which, which tended to be auto-related uh, ephemera, things like cars, car parts, gas pumps, signal lights, roadside signs, and so on. And he was able to do this because um, um, the space that he occupied um, did not have any kind of um, a, 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 a status or value in, in the real estate economy. In other words, he didn't have to turn a profit, and, and this allowed the functions of that space to emerge and transform over time through, through what I take to be the, a very vivid sort of improvisational programming. And so, oops, if, if, if museums have, have something to do with, with collection, with curation, with display, with exhibition, then, then, then perhaps the, the Car Wash Cafe might very well deserve to be considered a, 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 perhaps a, a, a kind of um, a, a outsider museum, a, a museological version of, of outsider art or, or outsider architecture. A, a mile or so away, uh, uh, also on the east side of Detroit, uh, the Yes Farm was founded as an artist collective. Uh, it, 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 was, it, was, it was a place where art encompassed the, the, the uh, many, many different things. Um, the cultivation of community farms, the staging of, of performances, uh, uh, the curation of music and dance concerts, uh, open submission art exhibitions, uh, uh, um, classes teaching uh, uh, things like carpentry and, and gardening, and, and indeed much else besides. So in, in the context of all these activities, um, I think it's possible to say at a place like the Yes Farm, the, the art of survival in an economically challenged neighborhood and, and art in, 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 in more sort of formally defined ways began to inform and transform each other. The, the work of the Yes Farm uh, took place in a neighborhood that was also the focus of ur an urban farming community. And its work was notable, I think, for, for focusing particularly closely on that neighborhood, and in particular on, on one single block where the Yes Farm occupied a, a, a vacant building. Um, in other words, this was a very intimate community. And, and it was a community in which the, the values that are uh, 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 um, um, sort of prized in, in the free market economy, uh, values like publicity, accumulation, development, and, and, and I think most especially growth. Th these are all values that were thrown into to, 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 to question. The, the Yes Farm seemed to, to uh, uh, disdain those values. And, and, and so in this sense, it's, its relationship to its context was, I think, very different from other sorts of community-based art practices in Detroit. Uh, and you, uh, apparently, uh, many of you went yesterday to the Heidelberg Project and the Powerhouse Productions. This is a different kind, this was a different sort of endeavor. Um, the Yes Farm did not regard its community, the existing community, as, as somehow somehow uh, 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 problematic, inadequate, flawed, necessary to, 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 to improve, to build, um, uh, uh, um, to fix. Instead, the Yes Farm positioned itself in uh, an existing community and sought to find opportunities and, and possibilities to work within that community uh, uh, on its own terms. And, and this, this to me was, I think, was one of the project's most, most interesting uh, dimensions because there was a kind of, uh, I think, radical suspension of, of the impulse to improve the lives of other people, whether this would be through art or, or, or any other means. And I, I think what, another way to look at what was going on here was a, a kind of bracketing of what's often called social practice. And in so doing, through this bracketing, a, an even more profound version of social practice emerged because it was a practice that not only involved 
a public, but it was itself a public practice. The way it was the way a public creatively coped with and altered um, challenging uh, 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 urban conditions. The the last project uh, I want to briefly share with you. Um, what it, it was the Detroit demolition Disneyland, which might be regarded as a kind of guerrilla curatorial project in, in which abandoned houses were publicly exhibited by, 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 by um, covertly painting them bright orange. Uh, this project was initiated uh, a, a few years ago uh, uh, when Detroit uh, was uh, ramping up to, to host the Super Bowl and, and as part of that process, was demolishing abandoned houses in order to uh, 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 beautify, uh, and I would put scare quotes around that term, to, to beautify the city. So as that was going on, as the city was demolishing abandoned houses, a, a series of, 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 of abandoned houses began to appear uh, in, in, painted in bright orange. Um, and then a, 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 a single communique was posted on an online news site about the project, which was uh, named Detroit Demolition Disneyland. Um, and, and the authors of this project uh, wrote that they were, what they were doing was simply endeavoring to invite the, the, the citizens of Detroit to, 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 to look at these, these brightly painted houses, but even more, more, more generally to, to look at all the decayed and deteriorating buildings in the city. And, and what this brought, according to this unnamed group, was what, what they called awareness. But they didn't say awareness of what? Was, was it an awareness of abandoned houses? Or was it the city's attempt to deny awareness of that abandonment? Or was it the agency of art to, 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 to critique the, the denial uh, 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 of the city in, in, in kind of mass, the, the massive abandonment of, of architecture? Or was it indeed the limit of art, uh, which was able to critique uh, an urban disaster but not propose uh, any alternatives to it? Um, the project raised those questions without suggesting any answers to them, and, and I think that, that too is one of its uh, uh, striking characteristics. In other words, it, it posed the city not as a, a problem to solve, but as a, as a kind of field of investigation and, and proposition. Um, so who was addressed by all this, uh, 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 and to whom or what could uh, all this kind of work make a difference? Um, um, the answer to those kinds of questions is, of course, I think, uh, a public. But as I think this image testifies to, and th this is an image from a, a storefront on, on Michigan Avenue, a, a public is sometimes a community that constitutes itself precisely when it is abandoned, precisely when it's left to its own devices, precisely when it's given up for dead. And I think there, there, there's a, 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 a righteous impulse to to, to, to try to give voice to the voiceless, to, 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 to try to give visibility to the invisible, to try to, 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 to raise the dead to, to, to the living. But can we really be certain that silence and invisibility are absences? Uh, it, it seems to me, and I, I'd like to end with this question, uh, perhaps at least some of the politics of public museology lies in, 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 in that question, in deciding which publics might be nurtured by engagement, by, 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 by collaboration, uh, by participation, and, and, and which publics might be nurtured by a kind of considered uh, and considerate uh, disregard. Thank you. Good morning. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, I'm Patricia Lanis. I'm the founder and director of Calta 21, uh, an IMLS-funded initiative. And right here, what's going on? Okay. Calta 21 stands for Cultures and Literacies Through Art for the 21st Century. It's an IMLS National Leadership Grant funded program. Um, this pro these grants are given and awarded to initiatives or models that uh, address uh, crucial pro problems in the museum world that can be somehow addressed by a model created that can be replicated or adapted nationally. 
And uh, the aim of the program is, and it's, uh, it's interesting because it ties very well to what Andrew was talking about, is our tagline has be is strengthening the immigrant voice. We have a target audience. Uh, our target audience are adult immigrants and their families. And the goal of the program is to build institutional capacity in museums and also in adult uh, literacy programs that serve immigrant, audience, immigrant students or immigrant audiences or don't serve them yet. And it's also to build um, academic capital among the students. So it uh, has different audiences. It has the museum uh, component, which is the building the institutional capacity, but it's also building uh, academic skills uh, with English language learners. And the, you know, it has been progressing. It's a three-year grant, and we are in the third year already. And it's, uh, we got, we evolved a lot and we shifted, and now it's not just about building language, but it's also about academic, uh, sorry, cultural and social capital, and civic engagement. So, what is a model framework? Model framework is, uh, more than anything, it starts, and I argue strongly for this, that art, there has to be a paradigm shift, and art has to be uh, like a human right or a basic right. But art, you know, it's about uh, active participation, not just, you know, I'm offering this, I have it here, come and visit me. It's like, how do you create something where everybody could, can have an aha moment in any environment and say, I want this, I want to do it, I want to ex experience it. And how do you create meaningful experiences uh, through art? Uh, the, another um, framework and guiding principle for us has been that adult immigrants, we can't part from the model, a deficit model. Oh, they don't have the language. We need to teach them the language. It's actually an asset model. What are they bringing to the community? And how can we, using that background knowledge and that, those prior experiences, how can we grow into a program that helps develop language. Um, the program also insists, and uh, through, our, you know, pro through our professional development, on creating an environment of shared authority where curators, museum educators, English language instructors, and adult immigrant students all have a voice and use their background knowledge uh, when participating in uh, the museum experience and in the classroom experience. And this, we believe, it allows for a lot of intercultural dialogue that is uh, uh, an important thing for our, our program. Um, art and language, there's a strong connection. Visual arts especially, you might not know the language, but you can see it. As long as you have sight, you can see the artwork and you can access it through perception, visual perception, through your emotions, and also through your native language. So it's like, how do you transfer what you are seeing, what you are experiencing, and what you're learning from the artwork, and what you are putting into the artwork, how do you transform that into the new language and make it into uh, a coherent conversation? And what's the role of the museum educator or the museum professional and of the English language instructor? And we believe in uh, you know, cultural competence being an asset for everyone in the museum world, but also among the students and the teachers. Uh, situated and contextualized learning, we have developed a professional development institute that addresses uh, you know, the, the concept of partnership, it's like, how do you reach to a community that, you know, it doesn't become, okay, I have this, I'm offering to you, come to me, or I'll go and I'll outreach to you. How do we l understand what's the need, what are the strengths of the community? So we have developed a professional development institute where we partner all the stakeholders of the program. And the curriculum, we have developed a curriculum, Identity, Portraiture, and Photography, that's uh, implemented at the museum and in the classroom. So through those strong partnerships that start in the Professional Development Institute, 
we take them into the classroom and into the, into the museum. And so at the end of the day, you know, for us it was, okay, there's a changing role for the museum. Museums need, you know, to start thinking about how do we engage the community and how do we empower the community. So it's more than access, it's inclusion. And what does inclusion mean? You know, how do you become inclusive beyond saying I have a program or I'll, I'll have uh, Dia de los Muertos or a, you know, a, an event that I, I gives access to a specific community. And, and we do believe it's part of starting a democratic, a democratic practice that can start at the museum itself. Mm, demographic trends in the museum world, uh, two million immigrants arrived to the US per year. And in 2008, 9% of the core museum visitors are minority, currently minorities. And uh, you know, we are uh, considering the immigrant community part of the minority. Predictions that come from the Center for the Future of Museums of uh, an, an, a committee or, or a group within AAM is uh, 2000 and, well, and from census actually. It's 19% um, of, of the US population will be foreign born in, the in 2050 and the minorities will be the majorities. So with that said, uh, we created, um, can you see this? Yes. Yeah, well, we created a, a model that we tested, implemented, uh, evaluated and redesigned, and it was we selected four museums in the CUNY, in the in New York, in New York uh, a museum that's very audience specific, the El Museo del Barrio. Then the Rubin Museum of Art partnered with us, uh, very uh, Himalayan art, very specific collections. The um, Queen's Museum of Art, the Godwin Turnback Gallery, which is a museum embedded in a, in a university. So how do you use a museum that's embedded in a, in a university? And how do you use it to do pre-service teaching uh, to future teachers? And the fourth uh, museum is a suburban museum. And it was, OK, how do you learn about a suburban museum? And how does a suburban museum relate to their communities that are immigrant-based. And uh, we partner those museums with adult literacy programs in, within the CUNY system and within the Westchester Community College uh, in Westchester. And we did the whole iterative process that I just mentioned. In professional development institutes, it's about building cultural capacity and institutional capacity, and we partner the museum educators and museum professionals, uh, community engagement, visitor uh, experiences, uh, professionals, with adult literacy instructors. And it's creating trust on each other's institutions and knowledge. And it's also understanding which pedagogies work for adult immigrants and which pedagogies work when you're using object-based instruction. And it's... Uh, the beginning and the launching of those partnerships and an understanding of each other's world. Hi. God, what did I do? Okay, the curriculum, it's, uh, implement, it's a 30-hour 30 uh, 30 curriculum, 10 units. In unit five, it starts in the classroom after the, uh, everybody participates in the Professional Development Institute, starts in the classroom. And it goes to, it's moving towards a self-curated museum experience by the students, adult immigrants, with intermediate uh, English language uh, levels. And it's all about, in unit five, they go to the museum and the museum is in charge during the first hour, second hour, everybody works in small groups, decide which works are relevant to them and which works they want to facilitate. And those students facilitate discussions in small groups. Towards the end, uh, Unit 10, the students curate a museum experience to all, for, all, for their families or friends. And they become its ownership and it is self-guided. You know, it's not the museum telling me what I want to see or perhaps what I should see or what's valuable, but what's interesting for me. So it's, uh, it's very interesting to see the reaction and the passion 
of the students and how, you know, in, in those images you see the first one is a teacher see, uh, doing, facilitating a discussion in the classroom with the students and with a reproduction, then going into the museum, students, uh, that's a student uh, facilitating a discussion, and then the next one is a family. Uh, and when I told uh, Julia, you know, Julia, you brought three kids, <laughs> and you were supposed to bring one, or, or you know what, why did you bring all your family? You also brought your husband, and she said, I wanted everybody to have the same opportunity I had. So, and, I, and so this is about, you know, family literacy also, and it's, uh, nurturing museum audiences. It's a long time, inv uh, long term investment, but it, that's uh, you know it's it's what it is. So testimonials. I'm not going to read it to you. It's a long testimonial, but it was a museum educator that was impressed by what the students could see in those tiles and what the students were talking about. And it was all about at the beginning. It it started with why is that art. What is that? And they had, you know, the curriculum is identity, portraiture, and photography. And it's identity of yourself as an immigrant, and what's the story that you have to tell? Where do you come from? Who are you today? And where do you want or expect to be in, when you're 80 years old? And the, the, the portraiture, somehow, you know, it's about building voc vocabulary, about portraiture, what does, it, what does a portrait show? You know, what do we want to show in a portrait? What can be a portrait? And it was interesting. We have, you know, lots of uh, students that at, at the beginning were saying, you know, why is this art? Why is this the, the museum? They look like bathroom tiles. Towards the end, you know, they were facilitating the discussion, and it all became about colors in the face, in the portrait, you know, the colors of the skin, colors on the eye, and, it, and the different shades that we have in our in our face. Part of this program is to have a national dissemination, and we're having on June 3rd an, an online symposium where practitioners, I won't be speaking, the practitioners who participated in, we have 15 uh, persons presenting, students, uh, museum professionals, evaluators uh, participating. I left some cards there. If you register, we'll send you all the information, or if you know anybody who might be interested in taking we have created a model that's applicable and adaptable to any you know, institution, hopefully. So, and we are, the, the goal is to create na, na, coalitions in different cities so that it's not just, you know, partnerships for us are the basis of understanding how a community works. And it's that what gives us the, the basis for a good uh, relationship and for a, a strong relationship that will last. So we are in the process of trying to build coalitions nationally in different cities. So thank you so much. And that's Good morning. How's everyone? Excited to be here? I'm thrilled to be here. I want to thank Sandra for the opportunity to participate today. And I want to thank uh, Judith and Meredith for um, all your hard work and putting this together. I know it's a, a huge undertaking, especially for two people, and so great job. Um, I'm Michael Chavez. I'm from the Mile High City. Please save your marijuana questions for the Q&A portion of the, of the uh, presentation. But uh, I manage the public art program for the city, and uh, as I'm looking at this, I wish it said public art czar or public art you know, ambassador or something, but... Um, so our program resides under the city agency called Denver Arts and Venues, which is a combination of what was once the Office of Cultural Affairs and the Office of Theaters and Arenas. So in addition to um, the public art program and cultural programs, we also manage city-owned venues. This is the Denver Performing Arts Complex, which is the largest performing arts center in the United States under one roof. It's uh, got an 80-foot high glass ceiling it has 10 performance spaces and on four city blocks in downtown Denver. We also manage the world-renowned Red Rocks Amphitheater. How many of you have been to a, a concert at Red Rocks? Good for you. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. Um, the Colorado Convention Center, this is a recent piece we installed 
um, just in January, and it's already somehow made its list onto Huffington Post as best new public art in the country, which we're very proud of. Um, and this is our good friend, the Big Blue Bear, uh, by local Denver artist, Lawrence Argent. The title is, I See What You Mean, and when this piece was installed at, just outside the convention center, there was a lot of uh, stories in the news of bears up in mountain towns uh, making their way into people's homes looking for food. So uh, when the Colorado Convention Center was expanded upon, he created this bear that's kind of peeking in there, trying to see what's, what's going on. It's, it's probably the most beloved piece in our collection. It stands close to 40 feet, 40 feet high. Um, so our 1% for Art program was established 25 years ago under Mayor Federico Pena through an executive order and then it became a city ordinance in 1991 under Denver City Council. Uh, this was largely prompted by the construction of the other DIA, the Denver International Airport, which is the uh, largest airport by area in the United States. It's 54 acres. And if you've ever flown in or out of Denver, you might be familiar with our friend, uh, the Mustang, known as Blucifer to some, by Luis Jimenez. Uh, it's pure coincidence that our two most recognizable works of public art are these 40-foot tall blue animals. <laughs> One is this, you know, kind of cuddly bear, you know, what's going on in there? And the other is this red-eyed, fiery stallion out on the prairie, rearing up and ready to uh, welcome you to the city. <laughs> um, so most of you are probably familiar with the model, but the uh, public art ordinance requires that 1% of any capital improvement project undertaken by the city, if it has a million dollar budget or more, that budget is set aside for public art. So since 1988, Denver has invested approximately $30 million into public art, and that is about 270 works of art. That doesn't include the historical pieces like fountains, monuments that existed before the ordinance, that adds another 100 on top of that. So uh, this is a tremendous benefit to the city of Denver and uh, visitors and citizens. Uh, it's launched art careers, it's supported our local creative economy, there are fabricators and conservators that make their living now fabricating public art. And um, the fact that it's the law is wonderful because there's never a debate about, oh, should we do public art or how much money should we set aside? And there's never that kind of um, wondering about it. We just know that we're going to do it, and it's built in. So it's, it's really a luxury. Uh, we have a very prescribed process by which we commission site-specific, unique works of art. But um, the ordinance doesn't really lay out things that you are all familiar with, like collections management, condition reports, maintenance, um, the publicity of the collection. You know, we're, we're set up to administer spending public dollars, but it doesn't say anywhere in there you must have a docent program or uh, what's your engagement um, policy. So I spent the better part of 18 years working in art museums and galleries, and I also have two uh, studio art degrees. So I'm very familiar with this conversation. Um, I probably had it without an ounce of irony, and if I were a betting man, I'd bet that all of you at in this room have probably had this kind of conversation at some point. Um, working in public art for the past two years and looking at the entire city as my gallery has been a really enlightening experience to um, bring art to an audience that isn't necessarily seeking it. You know, you don't have a, an audience that is looking for art has been a, a really interesting challenge. So while the 1% model is uh, it's wonderful and it's built in and, and it's what I consider to be a luxury having worked in nonprofits. By definition, it targets areas that are already thriving and developing and growing. And um, so the question is, how do we reach those other areas of, of the city that aren't as fortunate or just don't have that kind of capital improvement um, activity? So one way we're doing it is by this program called the Urban Arts Fund. This is a graffiti prevention project that is designed to um, target areas that are perpetually vandalized or hit with, hit with graffiti. Um, 
it's completely funded by our agency. It's not funded through the 1% money at all. And that's why I mentioned the city owned venues at the beginning because they, they provide this revenue stream that uh, gives us the flexibility to do a little bit more in our community than we might, uh, that other 1% programs aren't really able to do. Um, so what this does, uh, this is a piece we just finished last year. What this does is, um, More often than not, there is a mentorship aspect in which artists are working with um, youth groups from underserved communities. If you look on the very far right of the image, you can see the artist up on a ladder, just to give you a sense of scale, what we're working with here. And uh, he worked with uh, kids from a uh, youth detention center on this project. And they were thrilled, you know? They were so excited to be out there and working on this thing and to, to have something that they can call their own is a very powerful thing. This is a project in a neighborhood called Globeville um, on the side of a bridge on Interstate 70. And this neighborhood has never seen anything like this before. And um, uh, again, just working with kids and, and building those communities has been, has been really tremendous. This one's so large I couldn't fit it in the picture, but it says we are, we are but seeds of social change. And so our total budget for these projects is only $50,000. So each project is, is very modest in its grant. It's only between two and $5,000. And what these artists are doing with these projects is extraordinary. I think what I've learned is that artists just want the opportunity. Um, what Andrew mentioned earlier, the yes farm. I mean, I've learned working in a municipality how important the word yes is. Um, so often, you know, you get asked, oh, can we do this, can we do that? No, Parks and Rec says no. Public Works says no, you can't do that there. Sometimes I'm Dr. No, I can't, no, sorry, you can't do that. But when you're able to say yes to an artist is, uh, is a wonderful thing, for, again, for scale. You can see the two artists at the bottom here to see how large this piece is. These projects have been so successful over the past few years that uh, one of our city council people has dedicated uh, $10,000 from her own budget to do more projects in her district, which is wonderful. And we recently just received an artworks grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to do more projects and uh, um, kind of a larger scope going into 2015. PSU are here. This is a, a pilot project we're trying out this year. PS stands for public space. And where the Urban Arts Fund focuses on graffiti prevention specifically, this is aimed at creative place making and neighborhood revitalization through community driven projects. They're meant to be creative and physical improvements in communities and public spaces like parks, alleys, streets, sidewalks, courtyards, medians, and any underutilized gathering spaces that foster more uh, community interaction and also bolster the uh, economic vitality of those communities. It's a similar model we'll, where we will have $50,000 to work with. We hope to do six to eight good projects this year just to get it off the ground. And um, another reason our agency has some flexibility from those uh, city owned venues. So back to venues, um, this is the McNichols building, which is the newest venue in our portfolio. It was the uh, originally Denver's Central Public Library, it opened in 1910 and served in that capacity until 1956, until the uh, library moved to another site. In the years in between, it served some very uninteresting city functions, like you'd go to pay your taxes there, or uh, many years it said completely vacant. So um, our mayor asked us if as Denver Arts and Venues if we would take it over as a new project. And in October of 2012, we reopened the space as a new art and culture and events, uh, kind of multi-use venue. So what we do is we can uh, program exhibitions, events. Uh, in the beginning, we did a lot of these ourselves, but um, now we have a cultural partner program in which uh, nonprofits or any group in the community can use this building as their home base. They can use it as their hub that they want to do regular programming on Tuesday nights. They want to do dance lessons, uh, uh, music classes, 
Uh, it's a very diverse group of people that use this building. In 2013, we offered more than 200 events and programs and had over 40,000 visitors. That's just in our first full year of, of, of using the building. Uh, this year, by mid-January, we had already booked 65% of our annual goal for 2014. And um, so it's been a really, a really tremendous asset for us. Uh, this is a program we did with uh, the symphony and children. So we get hundreds and hundreds of people using this facility on any given weekend. Weddings, bar mitzvahs, you know, any, anything you want to use it for. And last but certainly not least, we just uh, launched the city's cultural plan. This was an 18-month process of research in the community and uh, Denver hasn't done this since the late 1980s, again, when the public art program was first established under Mayor, Mayor Pena. It outlines what, we, what we're striving and hoping to see in art, culture, and creativity within the city of Denver by the year 2020. And it's broken down into seven vision elements, um, not least of which is the integration of art and culture into everyday life, accessibility to the arts, arts education, um, amplification of the, the local talent and growing that talent so that they don't feel like they have to leave Denver to, um, to maintain their art careers. And um, there's quite a bit to it. The, you can read the whole plan if you go to imaginedenver2020.org. Uh, their whole comprehensive plan is there for you to read. Um, the research that went into this brought about some really interesting demographic information. Denver is the number one city in America that millennials are moving to. Uh, they're coming to Denver in droves, um, which is fascinating and ch changing the, kind of the cultural landscape of the city for sure. Um, short and sweet. If you want to know more about us, it's artsandvenues.com. And um, that's all I have. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me okay? I'd like to thank Sandra and AMC for organizing this panel on the very timely question of the level of responsibility that museums and their cities have or should have to one another in Detroit. Sandra invited me to be on the panel and I was honestly somewhat intimidated by the proposition of speaking alongside my fellow panelists. She reassured me, however, that she did not expect a position paper on the question, but rather asked me to speak about the work that I do as curator of engagement as it related to the city of St. Paul, how I engage St. Paul as an art museum curator. The Minnesota Museum of American Art bills itself as St. Paul's only art museum, which is surprising given the number of art museums in Minneapolis the Walker Art Center, the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, the Weissman Art Museum, to name a few, and the fact that St. Paul is a state capital, not Minneapolis. How is MMAA positioning itself within this highly competitive field and leveraging its place? What is the role of the curator of engagement in this strategy? I borrow Sandra's phrasing curating partnerships to describe the curatorial strategies and collaborations that I've explored, some more successfully than others, as MMAA's curator of engagement, a few of which I will share today. I'll close by reflecting on whether there is a distinction between a curator and a curator of engagement. Some of you may be familiar with St. Paul, the so-called Twin City of Minneapolis, like many siblings, the Twin Cities have a complicated and at times contentious relationship. In the Twins baseball team logo, Minneapolis and St. Paul personify Minnesota nice, the term used to describe the polite friendliness, genuine or otherwise, of the stereotypical Minnesotan. In fact, the cities aren't as close as one might expect.
Minneapolitans and St. Paulites take great pride in their respective cities' distinct cultures. You are either or, not both, and often frame them in opposition to one another. Minneapolis is more urban and associated with young hipsters, while St. Paul is a more family-oriented oriented city of neighborhoods with main streets. The cities are engaged in a not always friendly rivalry. Cool is a term that more readily applies to Minneapolis, and St. Paul's mayor, Chris Coleman, was sensitive to that fact. Making St. Paul cool is a top priority, which he defines as a place where people want to be. Being cool is important because it will draw creative people, or the creative class in Richard Florida's terms, to the city. In turn, attracting investment, the creative city economic development model advanced by urban planner Charles Landry in his landmark book, The Creative City, a toolkit for urban innovators. Private foundations are leveraging public funds to support the work of city leaders, community organizations, and residents in making St. Paul, quote, the creative epicenter of the region, end quote. The Knight Foundation has played an important role in creating opportunities for institutions and individuals to realize innovative ideas in the arts through grants that are themselves innovative, such as the Arts Challenge. Detroit was a beneficiary in 2013, and the competition for ideas is currently open for St. Paul. That is all to say that there are considerable financial incentives for MMAA to be in St. Paul, and downtown in particular. The culture at large uh, was simultaneously primed by the local movement to be supportive of a locally focused art museum. The local offered a strategy for distinguishing MMAA from area art museums like the MIA, whose most recent strategic plan included a commitment to embrace globalism. It is important to note that MMAA isn't just jumping on the local bandwagon. Supporting local artists and makers not only through exhibition and acquisition, but also as educators, is a part of MMAA's history and thus refocuses the museum's mission. MMAA has been St. Paul's Art Museum since the mid-1950s, though its roots go back to the late 19th century as an art school and gallery. The strength or advantage of this focus on the local and more broadly Minnesota was best put by local arts writer in his review of this exhibition, DIY Printing. He describes the palpable presence of the artists in the gallery and their work as alive with their do-it-yourself creativity. That is to say, the artists are present, available, and accessible. When I first started at the job, I was often asked, what is a curator of engagement? And what does a curator of engagement do? There was no precedent for the position in the institution, so there was no lead to follow and perhaps one other colleague in the cities was doing the kind of work expected of this position, Sarah Schultz, Curator of Public Practice and Director of Education at the Walker. The position was created through an NEA Our Town grant, which supports creative placemaking, a major buzzword and funding priority, uh, the creation of a distinct sense of place. Our friend and neighbor, neighbor, Springboard for the Arts Irrigate Program, is a textbook creative placemaking project, similar to projects that Michael shared with us today. The artist-led initiative spanned the six miles of the light rail line in St. Paul during years of its construction and sought to transform overlooked and undervalued public and shared spaces into welcoming places where community gathers, supports one another, and thrives. That's from there description of the work they're doing. This was the place and space that I was given and instructed to creatively place make in a dark corner <laughs> in between downtown and the artist community lower town of St. Paul um, that currently sits on the light rail line which is set to open very soon but isn't yet so it's kind of a dead zone. The first event in the space was framed as a weekend to preview the forthcoming MMAA project space, 
which would be the museum's only exhibition and program space, a significant milestone for the institution, which had to completely shut down operations in 2009 due to the economic downturn. Preview Weekend invited community members into the space, which was still under construction, to sample the kind of programming they could expect in coming months, and importantly, help shape the programming. Working with three enthusiastic interns who had a passion for engaging visitors, I developed with them what came to be known as community engagement walls. For one, we simply taped up brown craft paper to create a writable surface and pose the question, if this were my museum, I would. For the other, survey questions aimed at drawing out suggestions were disguised as a fun art making project. Some of the questions include, why aren't more people talking about blank? Why does Minneapolis get to have blank and St. Paul doesn't? <laughs> I'd like to meet blank and ask her him blank. There was a great one that read, I'd like to meet Frida Kahlo and ask her why Diego. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Coleman and Joe Spencer, St. Paul's Director of Arts and Culture, made an appearance. Uh, the director of the museum, Kristen Macholm, is speaking to them. Recognizing the piece of the mayor's vision for St. Paul that MMAA and its new space represented. Shelby Matula on the left is the one who designed the fun and engaging question slips. Nicole Wankel, another intern, is in the middle. A concern that visitors voiced repeatedly was a lack of recognition and opportunities for local artists. One person suggested, why don't you show a juried open invitation biennial here? MMAA's 2014 Minnesota Biennial will open in June. The exhibition was curated by a panel of jurors from an open call for submissions to which over 350 artists applied. Again, this was not a knee-jerk reaction to one person's comments. In 1952, MMAA established a biennial competition for North American craft folk known as fiber clay metal. By 1964, it had become the most selective national craft exhibition. In the 60s and 70s, the biennial's focus shifted to drawing. The studio sessions, Minnesota artists in the 1970s, told the story of how the strong artist community that the Twin Cities is known for came about. Photographs of artists at work taken by their contemporary Victor Bloomfield were shown alongside a work of art by each artist. On the left is Victor's photograph of Carol Fisher from 1974, and on the right, the artist standing next to her photograph 40 years later. And Victor is the one taking the photograph. The exhibition also acknowledged the key figures who supported the work of local artists, including Suzanne Cohn of the no longer extant Cohn Gallery at, in St. Paul. A panel discussion considered the impact of the decline of the tin, Twin Cities gallery scene. Um, you may remember that one of the slips read, I have a hard time finding galleries in the Twin Cities. Another exhibition-related program asked members of the community to present their stories of what the 70s meant to them as embodied in an object, a modification of the story night format developed by our collaborator on the program, Story City. Those objects were collected and incorporated into an installation by artist Mary Bergs whose practice utilizes found objects precisely for their stories and associations. You'll see the contact sheet that Victor presented in the previous slide, and the LPs were suggested by local writer Dylan Hicks' story. Her piece, What Goes Around, was what I refer to as a co-exhibition, a community-based or sourced art project, often interactive and experimental, shown alongside the exhibition on view. I was very excited when Sarah Hansen, a social practice sculptor, approached me about exhibiting the results of her participatory project in the gallery. The Biocenic Earth Laboratory consisted of an elaborate sculpture, much of which she cast, 
that collected time capsules filled with artifacts from participants, which included inmates at a correctional facility and patients of Children's Hospital in Minneapolis. The artifacts were often created utilizing the art making materials and instructions to write a letter to your future self of 25 years later that the artist provided. You see some of the creations in the image on the right. A guest curated contemporary fiber exhibition was on view in the gallery. And you see here two girls that participated in the experiment engaging with some of the works. The relationship between the co-exhibition and exhibition on view is not necessarily super direct. The timing of Sarah's project was somewhat inflexible since the exhibition at Project Space would be the final stop on the laboratory's tour of the metro area. I did see some formal similarities in the work that the girls were looking at and the microcosms that one could view through another one of her sculptures. The project space aims to be a community gallery, not only in name, but in practice, which is to say approachable and available to community members and organizations, though I do regrettably play somewhat of a gatekeeping role. Here you see the first co-exhibition project, another culminating exhibition of a community art project involving the St. Paul Public Libraries and Rainbow Rumpus, a nonprofit that publishes children's books for LGBTQ families. In addition to local artists, who is MMA engaging? Through a Knight Foundation grant, we were able to bring in Nina Simon, a pioneer of participatory museum, museum design, who led one of three talkback conversations that invited community members to have a say in the planning phase of the museum. The particular question she considered was how to create art experiences that were participatory, that people would feel invited to participate in. To explore that question, she divided the audience into groups and had them fill out a worksheet. I especially like how she defined community not simply as a community of color, but through interests and affinities that might include a person's ethnic or racial background. In an earlier closed session that Nina led for representatives from area museums, Joanne Jones Rizzi, director of community engagement at the Science Museum of Minnesota, pointed out the fact that community is often thought of as a code word for persons of color, which I just want to put out there for everyone to think about. The groups were then brought together to share their programming ideas, some of which I do hope to pursue. And I'll skip that. Partnerships are a large part of what I do as curator of engagement. The previous examples were largely project-based collaborations for sharing and swapping audiences. The Art Plus Music program is one that has grown to be a strong serial partnership that brings in new collaborators. The original idea was to offer students from nearby McNally Smith College of Music the opportunity to perform in an art gallery and perhaps be inspired by the art on view. The possibilities for the program were greatly expanded with the most recent addition. Artist Pritika Chowdhury created the artwork on the left during a residency studying the American Swedish Institute's glass collection. The piece draws on the Indian, Indian tradition of Jal Terang in which ceramic bowls filled with water are played as an instrument. We borrowed the piece from ASI and connected the artist with two percussion students from McNally who worked closely with her to compose a percussion piece, which students then performed. The collaboration connected ASI's program director with the students and conceived of the artwork's interactivity in a new way for the artist. So is there really a difference between a curator and a curator of engagement? Many of you are likely familiar with the Astor Gates Dorchester projects abandoned buildings turned into art spaces in the south side of Chicago, social practice and creative placemaking as urban renewal. At CAA this past February, during a panel discussion on the topic of exhibiting social practice, someone asked the panelists about the sustainability of such projects when they're largely the product of a single charismatic leader. 
or as Tony Whitfield put in a recent New Yorker article, quote, we're so personality driven and so dependent on creating heroes that we forget that a hero can be hit by a truck and disappear or just leave. What's sustainable about that, end quote. Gates insisted, I'm not moving, I have not moved. Staying becomes a political act, the most radical thing I could do as my class changes, as more opportunities grow, is to simply stay where I am. But if he had a wife and children, he might reconsider his decision to stay in a neighborhood plagued by crime and devoid of good schools. Does it matter that I live in St. Paul? How long do I have to commit to the city? These rhetorical questions start to get at the fact that the kind of work that is being asked of me is highly place-based in nature, which feels a little different, at least to me, from a curator whose work is not intimately tied to the city that their institution is based in. Um, Sandra alluded to this as a local sense of belonging. I'm still learning and figuring things out. Thank you. Um, I think I'll start off with one question and then we'll open it up to the floor. Um, so I think Andrew kind of hit the nail on the head um, about my anxiety thinking about uh, the museum in relationship to communities uh, or people who may not need or want our involvement or have different values not based on publicity, inclusion, and growth, as you mentioned. Um, but as re repositories of culture, museums, um, do we have a certain responsibility to tap into these um, expressions of culture. Um, so considering we are here in a room full of curators representing different museums, sizes, specialized fields, um, why do you think it is important for curators more generally to activate, um, actively participate in their local contexts? And what are some of the more innovative strategies and partnerships between museums and local communities you have seen work and some that might not have been as successful? So I will, I don't know if you, who wants to take that on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One strategy that I think is very important, it's like the conversation doesn't have to happen only between the education department and the community, but it has to happen, you know, if we want to bring, we are, this is a panel about social change in a way. So we're talking about new roles for the museum how do we bring institutional change? And it is you know, crossing those corridors and getting education, visitor engagement, and curators, everybody speaking about what the community is and how can you serve better that community, I think. And it's that interdisciplinary kind of approach within the museum also that allows you to have a better understanding. And I think that once you have a better understanding, you have more public coming in, or at least serving, you know, with relevancy to the public and moving beyond. And I guess because you're all here, you already have an interest on, on moving beyond, you know, the specific curatorial job that you have and also accessing and being inclusive. I, I might offer one response. Um, and I, I, I'll preface it by saying I, I'm learning a lot about museums and social practice and uh, being on this panel. But what if the question wasn't um, uh, how to further participation, collaboration, engagement as such, but rather how to further emancipatory politics, securing the lives of the dispossessed, and asking does participation, collaboration, and or engagement further that or not? Because, it, and, and then it seems to me that the, the, there are, it would open up a space for those situations and conditions in which um, what we're calling communities or publics in this context might be better off um, by themselves. And that, that, I mean, it's, it's one of the questions that's come, come up for me in this panel is our participation, collaboration, engagement, uh, uh, um, are, 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 are these universals? That, 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 that should be furthered at all costs, or, or do they have, um, do they have s s sort of more a, a nuanced relationship, nuanced sort of political status and, 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 and political effects? Way in the back.
budgets and uh, fixed budgets and fixed human resources to be allocating towards things like engaging local artists, engaging spaces outside the museum, engaging um, immigrant and minority audiences. But being that they have fixed human and financial resources, something has to be sacrificed in order to be investing in these things. And I would be interested in hearing what you think can and should be sacrificed in order to do that. I don't know the answer to that, but um, I will say that it's tremendously difficult to balance um, and not to be com totally crass or anything, but you know, grant-driven directives in a lot of cases to um, bring down the museum's walls, make it more permeable, more accessible, and the kinds of experiences that imply um, versus the donors and the kinds of experiences that they're looking for. Um, and just in my practice, I found that it's really hard to kind of offer both of those at the same time, but I think it's also important to figure out where that middle ground is, where kind of the audiences that historically have not been um, part of museum attendance can be brought into the activities of the museum while still at the same time not alienating the primary funders of the museum. And I would recommend um, getting away from your desk, getting out and speaking to people in the community, speaking with people who work for the city. Um, I've learned so much working with just city council and neighborhood associations, just knowing what, what people, finding out what people really want, um, not just the donors, not just your members of your institutions, but um, listening to those people in your community who want to be involved, they just don't know how to be involved. And that's what we learned through our process for the Imagine 2020 Cultural Plan is that um, there is a great need and want to be involved. People just aren't sure how to go about it. They, whether it's a financial barrier or um, a, maybe an educational barrier, but just uh, trying to create avenues that, that break down those walls. But um, I found that just getting away from your desk and your little world where you're working on your own little project has been tremendously helpful. Uh, oh. can, I, can I answer one more? Uh, there's also one thing that I think we have to move away from, thinking that this is a financial restriction, that you will be taking money from some pot to put it in, in audience and community engagement, because it's just a matter of how you figure out that community engagement uh, that might not cost you any money. You know, it might be just through the partnerships and uh, through new audiences. And, and look at, remember that slide that I showed you about the predictions of what's going to happen with museum audiences. Today, 9%, uh, one in nine comes from a minority. What's going to happen with museum audiences? You might have <laughs> wonderful exhibitions. So it's an investment, it's a long time in term investment, but I think it is a justifiable one. And it's like looking for partnerships that partnering with institutions of higher education, for example, for our program, and using the curriculum and the, doesn't cost you any money. It's just a matter of facilitating and saying, okay, the museum is willing to do this, and we'll open the museum perhaps on a Saturday night, because the students can only come on a night time, or have the museum educators on a Sunday, because the, you know, the mm, community that we're serving works three jobs, so they need to be at the museum. So it's flexibility from the museum more than anything. And I know that that might cost money because it's opening the museum at the time that it's closed, but it might be in a certain, you know, restrained, ga certain galleries only or something like that. Uh, so I, my question uh, relates to the future. I'm a big believer in a format of engagement. Um, and right now I feel that it's a great deal of culture for culture's sake and economic development. And as we make ties with the community, I feel we're going to become beholden to have more declarative programming, something maybe a little more political, and that's difficult with sponsors and grant writing and things of that nature because it'd be more polarizing. 
Do any of you have experience with that type of thing or any thoughts uh, related to the future and that particular issue? Um, in Denver, we've been trying to um, encourage people to do their own projects, not necessarily relying on just the funds that we're allocating through the city, um, trying to relax certain rules to the city. Uh, we found that there are quite a few trends in crowdsourcing, raising one's own funds to do a project. Um, and it's our job to be a resource to try to cut through some of the red tape to make sure that uh, people can get their projects done. So in that respect, yeah. hope that answers. Silence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, this is George from Patricia. How do you, um, especially in a suburban setting like Katona, how do you choose your participants? What, what, what process do you go through? Okay. What process do you go through to figure out who you want to serve at, um, in okay. uh, a very privileged place that's surrounded by places of um, high immigration and high um, multitasking families? Thank you, thank you. That's a wonderful question. It's interesting, you know, when we chose the suburban museums, I was the director of education in a suburban museum, and the main question was, how are they going to arrive? How is anybody with an, without a car going to come to us? So the uh, partnership with Katona, the Katona Museum of Art, uh, the basis to have audiences and being able to make that possible was partnering with, with community colleges. And by partnering with a community college, they have a captive audience. They have, you know, most of the students, and then we started partnering also with literacy programs and community-based organizations who are serving already, uh, you know, English language learners. And, but they are also looking for in not innovative ways of being more, in, uh, you know, having that community become more like a, a community and not just two groups, you know, the very wealthy and the community that serves the very wealthy. So it was done through partnerships and through the Westchester Community Go College and the Gateway Center that they have, which is a, a center for immigra immigrants. So they have the, the students, the people who go and register, you know, in their programs. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Any of you or anybody in the room know of such interesting programs that are focused on, let's say, historical art, or that at least involve historical art in, to a large degree, you know, as opposed to be primarily based on contemporary artists, artist practices, and engagement that way? I mean, with, again, with the Denver Public Art Collection, we have 100 works that were commissioned, uh, you know, in the early 1900s. So uh, we're always striving to uh, bring engagement and awareness to those pieces, not just focusing on the latest project that we just dedicated. So. Um. And uh, the MIA is definitely um, the other strategy in their um, five-year plan was also to really commit their energies and efforts to audience engagement. And they're an example of an encyclopedic museum. So in that case, um, non-contemporary or non-modern works are necessarily involved in that process. And we also have an excellent historical museum but again, Minneapolis, or Minnesota isn't that old of a state, but um, utilizes uh, cultural and material artifacts uh, that somehow convey the state's history in their um, process and projects to bring a wider audience into their museum's activities. We tried, you know, the in our iterative cycles, you know, in the cycles that we had, we had the, the, um, the Rubin Museum of Art, 
which has Himalayan art, and it's not con it might have a contemporary exhibition upstairs, but it's not contemporary art. And it was very interesting because it was a challenge that we thought, okay, it might not work, and it did work, but it was a matter of how do you, you know, through the process, how do you empower the visitor and the viewer to make that artwork accessible, but it's through their own curatorial process. You know, it's like the curatorial support is during the professional development and then the artwork. Artwork is art is art, you know, it doesn't need to be just contemporary art. Do we want to have one more question? And we probably should, um, or maybe two. <laughs> thank you. Um, my name is Shramoy Mitra and I want to thank the panel. I really enjoyed uh, listening to each of you. Um, I have a question that I'm actually thinking through, so I apologize uh, <laughs> uh, before I start, if I stumble my way through the question. Um, so I guess I'm trying, I'm, I'm curious to, I'd, to hear from the panel uh, about your thoughts on citizenship. Um, because most of the work that um, it seems to me uh, that you've spoken about is um, a way of creating a sense of belonging, you know, uh, whether we hear a lot about marginalized communities, immigrant communities, um, and, uh, you know, perhaps communities that are less fortunate, um, and developing the sense of belonging. Um, and when we're working within public institutions, um, you know, there is an uneasy relationship that we share with um, the question of nationhood and, uh, and, you know, reiterating these problematics of a homogen hom homogenized citizen. Um, so I guess I wondered, uh, I'd love to hear uh, each of you perhaps speak a bit about how you think about that question in relation to the work that you're doing. Thank you. The, uh, the PS You Are Here project that I mentioned earlier, the placemaking uh, grant project, is specifically focused on neighborhood organizations and uh, the Urban Arts Fund mural project, we commission artists directly, but PS You Are Here, we're connecting with organizations primarily so that there's more of a grassroots, community-driven um, collective consensus on what that neighborhood wants. So that's, that's one way that we're encouraging that. Yeah, we are, you know, through the process of the curriculum, the idea of belonging and owning the museum is, it's, this, uh, it's not just literacy, adult literacy, you know, learning English and critical thinking skills and how, but it's more than anything, understanding what is a museum, you know, why should I go to a museum? What do I do in a museum? It's like, does it, is it a place for me? So how do you get that happening? It doesn't happen with one time that you go to the museum, it happens through, it's a process, you know, and, and you all know because it doesn't, you know, it's like until you understand, if, you know, what's the purpose of everything and how you keep on going to the same museum. So that's why the curriculum for us, it's always going to the same museum and sometimes there's resistance from the teacher saying, we're going to go again to the same museum. Yes, you're going to go again because it's that sense of comfort and that's one of the beauties and I think that the, the most uh, nice things that has happened to me is listen to students wanting to bring their families. You know, I have so many saying, okay, we're coming back. And, uh, and that is, that's when something belongs to you. You know, you're going back to that place because you understand what it has to offer for you and what you can do in it. Shimoy, great question. Um, I think, I, mean, I, I, I love that question because I think it points to the way that participation, uh, assimilation, recognition incorporation in, into a public uh, or, or, or a citizenry um, um, has an oppressive and has oppressive and disabling dimensions as well as enabling and productive ones. It's, it's not, it's not, um, uh, 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 um, um, it, it's, it's not a given that, that it's, uh, I, I, 
for, for me anyway, it's not a given that it's a political good. And I think we know when you, your, 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 your question points out the need to really parse very carefully um, particular, the kind of particular instantiations of, 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 let's call it the social project to, 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 to sort of um, un, 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 unfold the, 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 the very specific sorts of participations, engagements, and recognitions that are, are being are, are, are put on offer because some, I, I, as I think your question points out, some of the some of the times those kinds of participations, those kinds of recognitions, can be very oppressive and disabling ones. Well, I I, I hate to we're going to leave that on that note. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I know, which is fine. I think it's, it's it's a lot of food for thought and also kind of um, provocative questions um, that you ask. So I know we need to move on to the pachacachas. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.